Lisa Monaco, thank you very much for giving us the, your time today. Sure, good to be here. Good afternoon. So the transition, have they been in touch with you? Uh, not me personally. Um, we are ready to uh, carry out the president's direction, as many of you probably have seen. The president's been very clear with his team that we are going to conduct a professional, smooth, comprehensive transition. Uh, and so the president-elect's team is, continues to work through, as I think has been reported, uh, a number of the steps that have to be taken so that they can come in and receive information. So we are ready uh, to provide that and to be as helpful as we possibly can be. Given the fact that uh, President-elect Trump <clears throat> campaign was very bound up with the issue of terrorism, is it sort of surprising they haven't been in touch with you yet? Well, I mean, after all, you are the top counterterrorism official in the country. Well, I think what's important to understand is uh, there was a um, process put in place. It's now um, preserved in statute, which I think was a great thing that was done. Um, the transition statute that was set up that creates a mechanism. So we've been working on this for some time, and the president-elect's team has been working along uh, with previously before the election, Secretary Clinton's team, and we had a number of meetings. There's a White House Transition Coordinating Council, of which I am a member, uh, and we had a number of meetings to facilitate the transition. Now uh, that we have the president-elect and his team, there's a number of steps they have to take to be ready to receive classified information, non-public information that we, uh, not only in the National Security Council, but across the government, everywhere from the Defense Department, State Department, Health and Human Services, you name it, the same uh, arrangements have to be in place so that they can properly receive this information. So that, none of that has, uh, no landing teams, as it were, have gone into any of these uh, agencies uh, while those final steps are being taken. So the landing teams, they would need to have top secret clearances to be briefed with what? So it'll, it'll vary, right, depending on what type of information they're receiving. But certainly, uh, individuals who come in to whether it's the National Security Council, the Defense Department, CIA, you name it, will have to have appropriate clearances in order to receive uh, information. And, but, and you have no idea who your successor may be? I do not. When, when you meet with him or her for the first time, what are the most important pieces of advice or warning you would give that person? Well, um, I think what's going to be critical for my successor, uh, and this is true across the terrorism community, across the national security, the homeland security community, um, is to make sure you're focused on the very complex and wide-ranging array of threats that we face today. Everything on my plate uh, today as we sit here is everything from terrorist threats, cyber threats, emerges, emerging infectious diseases. It is an extremely complex uh, environment uh, in which we're operating. Uh, and so I will be walking through my successor, uh, that, that landscape, uh, a number of critical issues that I think he or she should be focused on. But broadly speaking, I'll be also trying to impart, uh, I think, to be as helpful as I can, the types of things that I think they should be focused on. Building a good team, making sure you're asking questions, trusting your instincts. Uh, and then, personally, I would instruct him or her to live close by, because you're going to spend a lot of time uh, in your office. Uh, and <laughs> I would also uh, advise that person to stock up on vitamin D, because, as you know, I occupy a windowless office in the West Wing of the White House. And when I'm not there, I spend the rest of my time in the windowless situation room. So he or she will need to get comfortable with that. Um, and how many people work for you as directors or senior directors on the NSC that the new team will have to, how many jobs will, it, will they need to fill just in your space? So um, the National Security Council is comprised of a range of directorates, as you noted, everything from regionally focused experts from, uh, drawn, on, uh, drawn from experts across the government, uh, regionally focused, whether it's Asia, Europe, the Middle East, to um, functional or operational directorates like counterterrorism, cybersecurity, homeland security. 
And in 2009, the president combined the Homeland Security, previously Homeland Security Council functions and staff, into one National Security Council staff. So those directorates focused on counterterrorism, cybersecurity, homeland security issues report to me, uh, and that number's a uh, little less than 50 people. The national security staff as a whole is a little under 300 people. Now, the Obama administration has not sent prisoners to Guantanamo at all, right? At all, that's correct. So there's nothing preventing the new presidents from sending prisoners to Guantanamo, including American citizens, potentially? as was discussed in the campaign? So um, there's a few things here, I think. Uh, I, I believe the president-elect has spoken to this on the campaign trail um, uh, about keeping Guantanamo open. That's obviously not President Obama's view. It's not this administration's view. Uh, and um, from a policy perspective, there's nothing uh, to stop the next administration uh, from keeping Guantanamo open. From a legal perspective, when it comes to American citizens, uh, there is a legal structure um, governing and prohibiting military detention for um, U.S. citizens and putting, um, well, I, that's actually not quite right, um, governing no military commissions, so no military um, trials and mandatory military custody for a U.S. citizen. So this could be something that gets fought out in the courts yet again. Right. And similarly with uh, so-called enhanced interrogation techniques, sometimes referred to as torture. I mean, is there um, a new head of the CIA could bring back enhanced interrogation? So as a policy matter, uh, I suppose uh, that's possible. Um, what we have seen, as I think you know and your audience knows, President Obama uh, issued an executive order uh, amongst the first executive orders he issued uh, when he came into office was the banning of uh, torture, the banning of enhanced interrogation techniques, and taking the CIA out of uh, the so-called detention business. That structure was broadly codified in a statute last year that Senator Feinstein and Chairman McCain uh, worked on. Uh, so you have that in, um, in statute. But it would depend on what the techniques are. Uh, look, the, the checks on something like that uh, are, uh, I think, transparency and accountability and focus uh, on uh, it, all the focus that has gone into um, those techniques and, uh, and uh, the prohibitions on them, on what was wrong with them. Um, accountability and transparency, and frankly, people standing up. I think you've seen a number of uh, people say, I think General Hayden very famously said um, that if a new team were to direct those, uh, those techniques, uh, they would have to bring their own bucket, I think is what he said. But presumably you could find a lawyer in the White House to write a memo that said certain enhanced interrogation techniques didn't rise to the level of torture? Well, it wouldn't be a lawyer in the White House. As a, as a matter of executive branch um, practice, it would be uh, a lawyer in the Justice Department in the Office of Legal Counsel, which right. opines on the definitive view of the law for the executive branch. Some have claimed that ISIS is winning. What's your view? I disagree with that. Because? I disagree with that pretty profoundly, actually. Uh, because, look, what has distinguished ISIL has been that, in my view, it has operated as a hybrid threat, an insurgent army, a terror group, to be sure, directing attacks like we saw in Paris and Brussels, and as a social phenomenon, mm. right? using social media uh, and that engine uh, of the internet that we use for openness and, and transparency and public debate, using it to spew such venom that we know that they use it for. On all three dimensions, I believe ISIL is absolutely losing. They are being rolled back from territory that they used to occupy in Iraq and Syria, uh, losing some 50% of the territory that they used to occupy in Iraq and Syria. As a terrorist group, they're on the run. Uh, our operators, uh, the Defense Department, has taken uh, a number of very senior leaders, including those like Adnani, who are the external operations kind of champion and leader. Uh, they've taken them off the battlefield. And in the social media space and in the messaging space, we have retooled our approach to that and are going after that message as well, whether it's with 
um, our counter messaging tools, and by engagement with the private sector. I think what you, we've seen is um, companies like Twitter really scaling up their actions to stop ISIL from exploiting and abusing their platform. Uh, the numbers I've seen recently is over the last year, year and a half, some 360,000 pieces of, uh, or terrorist accounts have been disrupted and taken, taken down. And when you look at it, that's 1,000 accounts a day. That's, that's pretty good, and that's scaled up. And places like Google are putting in place um, very um, kind of new and innovative ideas to redirect those who are searching for ISIL content to other content. So I think we're, we've got them on the run, for sure. So is the threat level here in the United States and also in Europe, is it declining? And, well, is there, is there, and also just to add, it, you know, with, the, with the transition and also the new presidency, I mean, we saw 9-11 early in Bush's presidency, we saw the underwear bomber early in yeah. Obama's presidency. You know, is that, are you concerned about something happening in the early days of the new administration? Well, I'm always concerned yeah. about something happening, and that's um, pretty much what I get paid for. But I think it's a fair question. Um, and it's one of the reasons we are so focused on a smooth and professional and comprehensive transition. Because one, particularly in the national security, homeland security and terrorism, counterterrorism space, um, there needs to be a clear uh, transition of what we know uh, and uh, what we're doing and, and how we're going about taking the fight uh, to terrorists. We always have to be concerned. They are uh, relentlessly focused on uh, attacking the United States, attacking us. Um, I think Europe is a different, poses a different uh, challenge, whether it's foreign fighters flowing back into Europe, uh, more proximity uh, there, uh, you know, land borders as opposed to the sea that protects us. Uh, but we are all vulnerable, as I noted, to those inspired attacks. And that is something we are very concerned about uh, because it's much harder to detect, right? How do you know when something goes wrong in somebody's head and will inspire them to act. That person doesn't have to travel to get training and then travel back to conduct an attack. You mentioned the foreign fighters. Clearly, ISIS is in the process of losing Mosul. It might be a few weeks away. And what happens to these foreign fighters, these Westerners who aren't captured or killed? What is the plan? Can, are, you, are some being handed over to the Iraqis? Are some getting away? Is the Turkish border really sealed? So uh, the Turkish border uh, has been um, we've made a lot of progress on sealing uh, and moving up the defenses on the Turkish borders. The Turks themselves have taken a number of steps there. Uh, so I think the inflow on foreign fighters has been greatly diminished. And mm -hmm. we've seen a real decline uh, over time in the number of, uh, of individuals traveling and the number of foreign fighters what traveling. Is, what, are, what are the numbers that you're seeing now? So the foreign fighter numbers are down um, considerably over the last year, year and a half. The height, I think, over the course of the conflict, some 40,000 uh, yeah. fighters. But we've seen uh, over the last year a 50%, I believe, diminishment in the number of foreign fighters flowing into the theater. Now, your question uh, is the, the concern of, well, who's flowing out? And yeah. certainly, we're concerned about ISIL moving south. We're concerned about uh, ISIL uh, foreign fighters traveling back uh, and trying to flee out uh, to conduct attacks in Europe, and then ultimately uh, here being an e-ticket away when you think about visa waiver countries and the like. I think we have a number of defenses on that score. One is the ocean that separates us. So I do think Europe is more vulnerable when it comes to foreign fighter plots, as we have tragically seen um, in, uh, in Paris and Brussels and other places, and in Turkey as well. Um, but the, uh, the architecture that we put in place, and frankly, that was put in place across two administrations, both the Bush administration and this administration, to shore up our travel um, uh, protections, our screening mechanisms, our information sharing, both within our country, amongst our law enforcement and homeland security and intelligence communities, and with our international and foreign partners. And this is something we have, and we have to continue to do, and frankly, I will be talking to my successor about continuing to focus on the relationship and the information sharing relationship with our European partners, because that is critical. Some have claimed that Russia wasn't behind the hacks on the Democratic National Committee. What's your view? 
So I think we've seen pretty clearly that the DNI and the Secretary of Homeland Security spoke to this back in October, mm -hmm. being quite clear that um, the, the intrusions and the compromises uh, that we believe uh, were directed by the highest levels of the Russian government. Uh, and so we've, the DNI and the Secretary of Homeland Security have spoken to this, and then uh, we did a number of things and did, I think, substantial work to work with state and local governments and state and local um, managers, administrators of the voting architecture and voting infrastructure in this country uh, to shore up uh, those systems as well. Would you advise your successor? I mean, the electoral system in this country, is it critical infrastructure like our power grid? Should it be treated as such and that an attack on it will have a proportionate response similar to an attack on the power grid? So I think there's two things here. I think it should be treated as such. And yeah. in fact, we did so over the last six, uh, six months as we ramped up uh, for election day. Um, whether or not it is so-called designated as critical infrastructure, um, should not, uh, I think, affect how we're treating it. And frankly, that designation doesn't um, give you, it doesn't impede, the fact that it's not designated critical infrastru infrastructure does not impede what services, frankly, uh, and help that we can offer to state and local governments. So the thing, the thing that's distinct about the voting infrastructure it is, is that it is all in local, state, local, and private hands, right? So um, that we are always in an assistance mode, and that's what we did with, um, with the run-up to the election. But beyond assisting people, what happens when something actually does happen, and a significant hack has happened at DNC, which had obviously some political effects? I mean, what, what should the US government be doing in response, in, yeah. rather than just defensively? So the... When you're talking about designating critical infrastructure, so going back to the uh, voting infrastructure in the state and local communities, one benefit, I would argue, of making a, a designation, if you will, is that it helps in our um, establishment of norms. In other words, um, we have been working very hard over the last several years to try and establish international norms of cyber behavior and trying to get the international community on board with those norms whether it's at the G20 and other uh, mechanisms, the president's been um, very clear about trying to bring the international community into a set of norms and to agree upon them, to include norms like no nation state should attack uh, another uh, country's critical infrastructure in, in peacetime. Um, and so if uh, the attack is on a piece of designated critical infrastructure, um, you have that arrow in your quiver to isolate that actor to say you are out of step with these international norms. It, we can also, you know, do, it makes it easier to impose sanctions under the EO, the executive order that was adopted um, uh, in the last couple of years to impose financial sanctions on uh, cyber actors who attack critical infrastructure and, and take other steps. We have a few minutes left, so just I want to throw out some names of groups and just give me a brief um, kind of assessment of where they are. Al Qaeda Central, the group that attacked us on 9 11. Uh, largely decimated, uh, spending more time thinking about their own security than uh, how to plan and plot uh, against us, uh, but still determined. Al Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula, based in Yemen, which carried out the underwear bombing attempt. Al Qaeda's affiliate in Yemen, uh, determined persistent, particularly when it comes to uh, external operations and aviation plotting against the United still. States. Still. And their uh, key bomber is still at large. A Siri is yeah. who you're referencing. So they have been under relentless pressure. They are, they are still, as I described, a Siri uh, still, uh, as far as we know, uh, in, uh, in Yemen. Um, has he trained other people? We have to be concerned about that, yeah. uh, and that's the operating assumption. Um, but I will say they've been under relentless pressure um, by uh, our operations uh, and in uh, coordination with what we still believe to be the legitimate government in Yemen. But I will also say the turmoil and devastation that's happening there because of the internal strife 
between the Houthis and the former um, uh, the deposed government of Yemen has created a vacuum that AQAP has tried to exploit. Al-Shabaab? Al-Shabaab, um, a, uh, a continued focus of the United States and our partners, um, whether it's working with Amazon uh, and the Somali uh, partner forces, uh, we are focused on their potential to turn outward against us. That is not the case yet in terms of plotting external operations. However, we remain very focused on their ability and desire to plot against U.S. and Western interests um, in the region. Okay. Similarly, so um, uh, their, their allegiance uh, and ability to align themselves, whether literally or figuratively or message-wise, with ISIL is a concern. Are they a subsidiary of ISIS, or do they take, is there any command and control? <clears throat> they have taken on uh, a mantle, and I will say Boko Haram is probably one of the most brutal and violent organizations that we've seen as, as with ISIL, but is particularly, um, I think, brutal in some of the attacks they've undertaken um, within, um, uh, within Nigeria, within Kenya, within the region which they operate. Um, but they have taken on the moniker of Boko Haram slash ISIL West Africa. So mm -hmm. they are trying very hard to take on, uh, take on that mantle. Whether what, there's command and control remains to be seen. What about Nusra? Are they playing a long game? Are they going to survive, out-survive ISIS in Syria? So uh, I'm concerned that they are trying to play a long game. I am particularly concerned about two aspects about Nusra. One um, is their ability to continue to foment and contribute to the chaos and devastation in Syria, which has basically been a magnet for whether it's ISIL, whether it's Nusra, but most particularly um, the veterans of Al-Qaeda. Uh, Nusra is, in essence, Al-Qaeda in Syria, now the largest Al-Qaeda affiliate. How many people? You know, the estimates really range, but the, the people I'm most concerned about uh, are those Al-Qaeda veterans who traveled uh, and began a couple of years ago to uh, take up root in Syria, in the ungoverned space left by uh, uh, Assad's brutality uh, on his own people, uh, to have a space to plot and plan against the United States, which is why you saw in September of 2014 um, us initiate military actions to take out uh, those leaders and to take out those plotters, those actions continue. That was the, the Khorasan group? That was the Khorasan, a so-called uh, group called Khorasan group, but they really are Al-Qaeda veterans who decamped from Afghanistan and Pakistan to go to Syria to take advantage of that ungoverned space. Any of them come from Iran? You know, there's, uh, there's been lots of reporting and speculation about travel, uh, how, what the roots are, but yeah. we know for certain They've come from the Afghanistan-Pakistan region. But I will say, Peter, this is another area where I will focus with my successor uh, on Al-Qaeda and Syria. We focus quite rightly on rolling back ISIL and on eliminating uh, and uh, destroying it as, and across the three dimensions that I mentioned. But Al-Qaeda and Syria, we, will, we have been relentless. And I would argue the next team should be relentless about going after Al-Qaeda and Syria, because we cannot let them um, take advantage of uh, the chaos in Syria to mount a long game against us. Are you concerned about a son of ISIS, a grandson of ISIS? After all, ISIS is merely the son of al-Qaeda in Iraq. I, I am, um, whether it's son of ISIS or Boko Haram yeah. or al-Shabaab, uh, because I'm concerned about the underlying conditions that have allowed ISIL to take root uh, and have allowed Boko Haram, et cetera. And really what that comes down to is grievances that are unaddressed. That comes down to rising sectarianism uh, yeah. across the Middle East. And until we address those issues um, and until those governments can get a hold of those issues, I, I worry uh, greatly that we and our partners have a continued challenge on our hand, which is why President Obama has taken um, uh, the last eight years to put in place a sustainable counterterrorism architecture that can withstand transparently uh, a, a long game when it comes to fighting the terrorist fight. We have to do so with our partners where we can, unilaterally where we must to go after uh, 
threats against us, but ultimately we have to build capacity in these partners, in these governments, to address the threat uh, where it is so that we don't have to do it solely. Final question, what are you going to be doing January 21st, 2017? Napping. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much.